Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to Poetry Thursday, a happy, frolicsome BookTube event in which BookTubers, a tiny handful of them anyway, remember that poetry exists as a genre and read you a poem. Uh, I do that. I also add commentary on the poems that I'm reading, and in addition to that, I am naturally building a girlish melodrama out of the whole thing. <laughs> because uh, we are following a horrible psychic progression <laughs> in which Poetry Thursday is going to get less and less happy and frolicsome and more and more fraught and angry <laughs> until who knows what kind of horrible frothing consummation results. <laughs> Just what you think of when you think of poetry. And the reason for it is because of the anthology that I chose to plumb for Poetry Thursday, and that's this. 20th Century American Poetry. A very good anthology. Uh, it would pretty much have to be <laughs> uh, to survive the withering fires of my latest book unhaul, my latest book culling. I really enjoy this. I think the, the notes, the introductions, it might be a little starry-eyed, but they are wonderful. And the selections are wonderful. But the time period is fraught. I have always described 20th century American poetry as the place where poetry as a popular genre went to die. And I still hold that opinion, and although this anthology doesn't know that I exist, it's clearly going to try to talk me out of that opinion. Uh, and we're getting closer and closer <laughs> to uh, the point where the list of poets that we will do on Poetry Thursday stops being uh, who's that and starts becoming a rogues gallery. We're almost there today. Almost. Today we are doing the poet William Carlos Williams, who is not himself intensely offensive, although he was championed, touted from the rooftops, and taught by someone who is. <laughs> There's that. Uh, the, this book considers William Carlos Williams to be incredibly major, an incredibly major poet. They give uh, pages after pages of introduction to him, and then lots and lots of his poems, in a way that, and here I'm not the first person to grouse at this, in a way that if his name were William Douglas, they wouldn't do. Uh, but this is the, the one of the earliest warning signs of what the 20th century in America did to poetry, is that you start to hang all sorts of significance on trifles and dare your audience to say, hey, that's just a trifle. <laughs> you dare them to do it, because you have arranged things in much the way that art museum curators have arranged things, where if they do that, you get to just titter with the cool kids uh, with the raised flutes of champagne in the far corner saying, <laughs> can you believe he thinks that's just a trifle, when I heard from Marcel that it's actually incredibly important. Okay, what's this important? Well, I didn't say that I saw its importance. I don't know anything. <laughs> just don't mind me. I just give 50000 a year to the museum. That's all. It's Marcel who knows. Not the work. The work doesn't tell me. No, it's Marcel, the priest, who tells me. <laughs> and I believe him. <laughs> you don't? Oh, good Lord. Where were you last season? <laughs> those snobs, those, those uh, museum snobs, do that about the open frauds that are on display in museums of modern art. They do it for Calder mobiles, or Picasso paintings, or open canvases that have raw splotches of paint on them. Obviously done at random when the painter wasn't looking. Oh, that's the whole point, though. He wasn't looking. <sighs> Designed not only to separate you from the perfect reliability of your own good common sense, but also, more importantly, to separate you from wads of money. Uh, that attitude happened in America. I think that if someone were to do an accurate sociological study of it, the root of it would be that there was a time in, early, in the early 20th century in America where huge numbers of people from the provinces, huge numbers of people from small towns, rural districts, and farms were suddenly lured to the big cities. But they didn't know anything. They, they, they'd had, you know, one-room schoolhouse education and didn't know what, whether or not to trust their own instincts and also how to hone those instincts. So they were perfect fodder for hucksters. I think that ultimately, if anyone were to write such history, that's what it would be, that, that this is the kind of thing that you would do to rubes. 
the thing that's always amazed me is the number of uh, intelligent people among the so-called cognoscenti who ought to know better. And also a perfect example, a very early example of American gaslighting. Gaslighting is when someone tries to tell you that what you're seeing with your own eyes is not what you are seeing with your own eyes, and offers no explanation like the counterintuitive explanations of some forms of science where what you're looking at with your own eyes is in fact wrong. They don't offer any explanation at all. They offer what a priest offers. I'm telling you, my interpretation is this, and I want you to believe it and pay me for more interpretations. Uh, I'm not sensing a whole lot of that in William Carlos Williams, in, in William Douglas. <laughs> I'm not, really, not sensing a whole lot of that in him, but I know that this is, this is going to have the... I don't think any cognoscenti are actually listening to me now, but who knows down the line? These videos are out in the world. Who knows? We'll find them down the line. I have a feeling that I can guarantee that some snobs will find this video and already have their pinky in the air, already have their pinky by their mouth, already being that, that pained, embarrassed look of someone who refuses to do what you tell them. <laughs> and they'll be saying, is he actually saying that William Carlos Williams' poetry would not have propelled him to success if his name hadn't been odd and, and repetitive? <laughs> Are, is he actually saying that our absolute insistence on spelling E.E. E. Cummings' name without any capitalization is part of his success, not his verse. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I'm going to read you a couple of poems from William Carlos Williams. From William Carlos Williams, Carlos Williams. I'm going to read you a couple of poems by him because I want to do right by him. Frida, cut it out. Stop the uh, She's very, very pent up with energy. <laughs> My little needle point Frida is very pent up with energy because it's 95 degrees here which means that dog walks can still happen, but they have to be very short, far shorter than she wants them to be. They have to end before she's tired. They have to end only when she's overheated, and there's a difference between those two things, and she doesn't like that at all. But anyway, uh, we're going to read two of his poems. The, the anthology includes 20 or 30. First one we'll read is Dedication for a Plot of Ground. This plot of ground facing the waters of this inlet is dedicated to the living presence of Emily Dickinson Welcome, who was born in England, married, lost her husband, and with her five-year-old son sailed for New York in a two-master, was driven to the Azores, ran adrift on Fire Island Shoal, met her second husband in a Brooklyn boarding house, went with him to Puerto Rico, bore three more children, lost her second husband, lived hard for eight years in St. Thomas, Puerto Rico, San Domingo, followed the oldest son to New York, lost her daughter, lost her baby, seized the two boys of the oldest son by the second marriage mothered them, they being motherless, fought for them against the other grandmother and the aunts, brought them here summer after summer, defended herself against thieves, storms, sun, fire, against flies, against girls that came smelling about, against drought, against weeds, storm tides, neighbors, weasels that stole her chickens, against the weakness of her own hands, against the growing strength of the boys, against the wind, against the stones, against trespassers, against rents, against her own mind. She grubbed this earth with her own hands, domineered over this grass plot, blackguarded her oldest son into buying it, lived here fifteen years, attained a final loneliness, and... dash. If you can bring nothing to this place but your carcass, keep out. Now, I think we can agree on a couple of things here, right? That is lovely. In a way, that is lovely. That does what we want good poems to do, which is to convey at length or in extreme brevity in a whole world, an entire world. It's lovely. It's very evocative. It has lots and lots of energy. It, it's not a poem. I, I can't show you it, but it, it, I can't show you the text on the page, but you can easily look it up. I'm sure it's in the common domain by now, but it's not a poem. It's, it's evocatively written, and it's oddly stacked. It's, it's a skyscraper, definitely, but uh, it, it's, it has nothing in it that isn't just prose at all. It has lovely imagery, and it was around this time that the idea started to float into some people's mind that if we can say that poetry is just lovely imagery, then we don't have to learn how to master any of the, things that, the other things that it is. Uh, and if we do that, if we succeed in that, well, then we're only one quick motion away from saying that whatever we write is lovely imagery, even when it isn't, and then we've got the whole ballgame. <laughs> then we can win the Nobel Prize. Uh, 
but we're going to read another poem. Uh, we're going to read a poem called Queen's, Queen Anne's Lace, uh, which is the, the last poem was uh, fierce and I believe a little condescending. This one is intensely erotic. Uh, her body is not so white as anemone petals, nor so smooth, nor so remote a thing. It is a field of wild carrot taking the field by force. The grass does not raise above it. Here is no question of whiteness, white as can be, with a purple mole at the center of each flower. Each flower is a hand span of her whiteness. Wherever his hand has lain, there is a tiny purple blemish. Each part is a blossom under his touch, to which the fibers of her being stem one by one, each to its end, until the whole field is a white desire, empty, a single stem, a cluster, flower by flower, a pious wish to whiteness gone over, or nothing. That's from 1921. So some of these poems, we're still in the earliest years of the century. We're in our, our depth of the century. We're 100 years ago. That is also lovely. It also doesn't have any rhyme or reason as a poem. It's, it's just the author meditating that why pick something, something to evoke the whiteness of the particular woman that he has in mind. Why evoke something distant and exotic like an anemone when you can evoke a field of wild carrots and their flowers? And what will come to mind when you look at the little bruise at the center of the, of the flower? What will come to mind? He enters the poem. A man enters the poem and bruises enter the poem. Quite good, I think. The, this anthology includes a lot of other stuff by William Carlos William, Carlos William, Charles Williams. But these things I think will do to show that although there is poetic sensibility here, although there is a, a first-rate writer here, there's a bit of drift going on bit of lateral drift going on uh, and we're going to see more of that <laughs> to put it mildly we're going to see more of that on Poetry Thursday maybe not today but certainly next time because next time we are going to deal with the figure who shouted William Carlos Williams Carlos Williams Carlos Williams from the rooftops and praised him and taught him next week we're going to deal with another one of those titanic figures one of the first in the 20th century who would definitely fit in a rogues gallery uh, so i'll wrap this up for now uh and we'll reconvene next thursday <laughs> thank you book two